Our next session today is Echo the Patient Perspective, and it's going to be moderated by Dr. Martin. We have uh, three wonderful panelists who've been kind enough to come, and I'll let Dr. Martin introduce them. Uh, we are really very, very fortunate to have these three individuals. Not only have they uh, come here uh, from some distance away, but they've uh, volunteered to let us learn their story. And this is really a critical aspect of what we do, individual patients, taking care of individual patients, making a difference in patients' lives are very, very important. Bill, let's go back to January uh, 2005. I can remember, this is about 10 years ago, I can remember like it was yesterday, I was sitting there reading the newspaper and I felt a vibration in my neck. And I, of course, would have ignored it until that night. My wife, we were going to bed, and she had her head on my chest and she said, whoa, that's, that's a loud, loud vibration, so you probably ought to see your doctor. And uh, I called my GP and got in in about a week. But then he listened and he said, whoa, uh, that's, you, that's need never good. That's never good. <laughs> <laughs> you need to see a, a cardiologist uh, pretty fast. And, uh, and you point, did. I did. did they, and they ordered an echocardiogram? They did. And what did and, that show? Uh, it showed you know, half of my blood going back into the heart. Uh, and you know, up to that point, I had been um, perfectly healthy. Well, did you understand the severity of what, what was shown on the echo? Yeah, after uh, seeing the echo, my doctor said, uh, Mr. Wallace, I'm so sorry, you're going to have to have open heart surgery in two weeks. <laughs> we have an interesting uh, connection here. You had a, a, a friend who mm -hmm. was a prominent uh, cardiologist at a, another clinic called the Cleveland Clinic. Mm -hmm. And did you get in touch with him? I did. Uh, after seeing my GP, I called my... Dr. Jim Thomas, and uh, he did the echo so, in uh, a few weeks. Let's get, uh, Jim, you've got a, a few minutes to tell the story, so let's get you in on this story. You know, it's, it's said that there are no diastolic murmurs louder than a four. His was a five. It could, you could hear it without the stethoscope. And so we did an echocardiogram. And maybe a little subtle here, there is a clear disruption in the aortic valve there. And uh, when we turn on the color Doppler, again, the, the black and white's a little subtle. The color pretty much is uh, hitting you in the face there, and uh, uh, not much doubt about that. Um, we were concerned that the usual things that can cause acute, severe leakage of the valve are things like infections and dissections. And so we did a test called a transesophageal echo, where you stick a probe down the throat and you get a very high resolution view of the valve. You can see there is uh, really severe leakage going through that valve, and um, uh, with the, the transesophageal echo, we could look very carefully. This is playing in slow motion, and uh, you can see that on this cusp right there, the non-coronary cusp, there is, it's just sort of flapping in the breeze there, and uh, so we could very quickly make the <laughs> diagnosis as to uh, where the leak was coming from and why it was, and uh, I got in touch with my good buddy, Josta Pedersen, uh, the sainted Swede, as we call him, at the <laughs> Cleveland Clinic, and he uh, took uh, Mr. Wallace to the operating room and found what he had was congenital fenestration of his aortic valve, and this is something he had been born with, little holes in each of his leaflets, but because the leaflets are a little redundant, they're a little longer than they actually need to be, these holes didn't leak until one of them blew out. And Bill got a, uh, a nice uh, biologic valve, uh, uneventful recovery, discharged on day four, flew home on day five, and there is one uh, final punchline. Yeah, um, he's actually my college roommate, so you can <laughs> see uh, young Dr. Thomas yeah. Yeah, and uh, young Mr. Wallace and a that's very great. disinterested Bob Lindsay in the middle there. <laughs> and uh, oh, love there it. he is at the time. <laughs> Bill, um, Obviously, uh, we're talking about echocardiography and its value. It had, it had tremendous value in your particular case. Oh, yeah, case. you know, I'd probably save my life. Uh, who knows whether that, uh, that second leaflet or third leaflet would have ruptured too, and then who knows what would have happened. So I'm a living testament to the value of echoes. Jim certainly knows, many of us know, the, the use of ultrasound echo in the operating room to assess the mm -hmm. adequacy of the surgery while, they're ha while the surgeon's doing it is extremely important. Yeah, no, absolutely. It, it lets the surgeon do things they would be too nervous to otherwise do because they know you'll get a second look, they'll get a second chance at, at fixing it there, and uh, it's been a, a great thing to advance uh, cardiac surgery overall. So you do yeah. have follow-up exams. Sure, I have an echo every other year with my local cardiolo cardiologist, and uh, 
Recently this year, I had a little uh, arrhythmia where I had to do a flutter ablation. And when that happens, you become very, very aware of every heartbeat. And uh, were I not, I had an echocardiogram at the same time, and it, it proved it wasn't the valve that was a problem or anything else in my heart, it was just this um, flutter. And by being able to see that on the echocardiogram, it gave me a great deal of comfort, and I think it keeps my heart from uh, racing too fast. <laughs> and little I know when I met that kid on, the, on your right, uh, the 18-year-old, that he would eventually help save my life. Yeah, so. I think it's yeah. a fabulous story. It's <laughs> yes. a fabulous story. All right, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, and let's go next to Sarah Woodruff. Sarah, tell us a little bit about uh, how you came to understand your cardiac condition. So I was born in 1978, and shortly before my fourth birthday, so this would have been the summer of 1982, I rolled out of bed and conked my head on our hardwood floor hard enough that my mother was concerned about a concussion. So I end up in the emergency room, and the internist who was examining me turns to my mother and says, so please tell me about your child's heart condition. And my mother says, what heart condition? And this was the very first time anyone had said there may be a problem. So less than two days later, I was being seen here at Children's National. I am a DC native. And it was then that I had my very first echo. What that found uh, was the first of three defects. Uh, that was the initial stage in identifying a coarcted aorta. So I had a coarcted aorta, I have a bicuspid aortic valve, and I have a compromised mitral valve. The papillary muscles are underdeveloped. And so echo was a very critical piece right. in that initial diagnosis. So less than a month later, I did have surgery to repair the coarc, uh, which at that time was a very major procedure, and now you'd be able to do it with a stent. It's amazing. And I have needed very routine follow-up since then. And echocardiography has been a crucial part of that because it's such an excellent, inexpensive, clearly non-invasive way to get such good structural data. I also required a valve-sparing aortic root replacement. Coarc patients, we tend to dilate. And what was wonderful for me was being able to use echocardiography, as my aorta got bigger and bigger and bigger, to be able to track that with these really excellent measurements to provide me with a clinical diagnosis of, yes, now is time for surgery before I ever became symptomatic. And it meant that I've been able to carry on with all of the activities that are important to me, with my working life and my family life, uh, without having to interrupt that prior to surgery, and, and ECHO was really key in making that possible. Great. We'd be remiss if we didn't say there are other spectacular imaging modalities, MR as certainly as, as Jack knows and all of us know. But, but for a child or a young adult who has had surgery and is going through this, ECHO has certain advantages over MR to you as the patient? Absolutely. I have needed a total of three MRIs, but I was fortunate enough to not need my first one until I was an adult. And the imaging people that I have worked with over the years have been marvelous. I had wonderful experiences as a child in terms of them explaining to me and these pictures that were just so amazing to be able to see inside my own body and to watch that technology evolve over these last few decades. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to have two children and of course with congenital folks like me, they want to do plenty of fetal echo work and to be able to see my own baby's hearts long before uh, I was going to be able to hold them and to get reassurance about the structural integrity of their own hearts has been uh, not only a very critical diagnostic piece but very comforting to me as a patient. One of the critical things in this, this country is the role the sonographers play in interacting with the patient. Sarah brings that out. That, that it's really the care and the compassion that goes on with those exams as well as the diagnostics. And I want to introduce Alexis here, Alexis Eisenberg. Alexis, uh, take me back to uh, April 2010. What happened uh, on that bad day? Yes, um, I had just found a lump in my breast. Um, actually was sitting on the phone with my mother who was crying indicating that my father was just diagnosed with stage four lung cancer. Um, She's in the parking lot getting ready to go have a mammogram. Yes. When she finds this out. So um, I ended up having unfortunately invasive stage three breast cancer. She's had 18 operations. Uh, so you had uh, double mastectomies, you had chemo, you had radiation, and then you went uh, with some excellent physicians at Hopkins. You did the, yes, I was, the HERS-2 vaccine. Tell yes. us a little bit about the role of that in your, in your heart. I was uh, put on, during routine treatment, uh, the Herceptin that Dr. 
uh, Martin had discussed previously and um, had to continue that treatment in this vaccine trial. I was very fortunate to be chosen as one of 22 women um, to take part in this Johns Hopkins vaccine trial through Dr. Dr. Alicia Emmons. As he had discussed earlier, I was the patient that ended up with the Herceptin that hurt my heart. Uh, they did routine echoes through the entire trial, actually through all my treatment, every three months. And I was, the vaccine included four vaccines that you took through this year process. And I maintain that the required number throughout the, through the uh, process until I got to the fourth vaccine. And that was when my, uh, it was too low and I was immediately just kicked out of the trial. And luckily my heart rebounded very quickly within two months, had a follow up echo and uh, it, it, everything is fine on that end. Did it, you know, the fact they told you that it's um, no radiation, it's no harm to you, and um, did that help with your, you know, saying, gee, I don't want another test? Well, it's sort of strange because the echo, because of it being so non-invasive, like to me it was just another test, and it was so easy. I, I never really uh, thought that much about it until, it until they said, no, you're done. We, we presented data that echo has a role, and in helping for surveillance and detecting any abnormalities. Does that seem, in, do, does, in, in talking about cardiac effects later, is that important to breast cancer? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I, I mean, well, I'm not even sure if that wasn't detected, um, and I'm sure most of you know what, what that really would have done to me as a long-term effect. You know, we hear a lot about unnecessary testing, and certainly there is, and the society's doing a lot for that. but. How, how do we need to tell the story that ECHO has a tremendous value in a value-based healthcare system? Just thoughts off the top of your head? Bill? You know, in, uh, in our business, uh, the best way to convey a message is to have a friend tell a friend to do something. So I would urge you to, if you've probably done this, but every one of your patients has used an ECHO to get on Facebook or Twitter and talk about the benefits of it like we've done up here. And, you know, this, you know that's better than you, than this foundation telling people, get people who've been through it to start saying how great it is and that they save their life or improve their life uh, outcomes in this way or that way. Once again. No, I was just thinking about the marvelous visuals that Echo provides and in this multimedia environment, combining that with mm -hmm. the sort of patient to patient yeah. message, that, that when people can see things, that that has a much more compelling impact. Back it up with appropriate use criteria and those sort of things, because each one of these individuals, the echoes, were and have been very appropriate in their use and have, have not only reassured them but have led the proper diagnosis. We really do want to thank these three. They're fabulous individuals. We're grateful for your help uh, and your health and certainly we may be calling on you in the future but we're most, uh, most thankful that you're all doing well and, and appreciate you being here. Let's give them a good round of applause.